Hi, uh, thanks for coming to our College of Engineering seminar series. Today we have a speaker all the way from New Orleans coming up here to see us. Uh, Dr. Phoebe Zito is today's speaker and she is assistant professor in the chemistry department at the University of New Orleans. Dr. Zito's research focus is on photochemical formation and fat of petroleum derived dissolved organic matter. Uh, Dr. Vito holds BS from University of South Florida and a PhD from University of New Orleans. Please welcome Dr. Zito. All right. Good morning and thank you for the introduction and thank you for allowing me to come and speak today. This is my first seminar as an assistant professor. Um, and so um, the title of my talk is going to be on the photoreactivity of petroleum-derived dissolved organic matter, um, which I'm going to refer to as petrodom, um, just for clarification. And so first I want to acknowledge the following people um, who have helped me through my graduate and postdoc career. And um, this is my former group when I was a graduate student, and then this is my current group, um, which is now up to 14 at the University of New Orleans. And of course, um, I always want to thank my funding and collaborations, um, because without them, I wouldn't be able to do the research that I do today. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the University of New Orleans. Um, we're a very small um, research institution located in the heart of New Orleans, and we're the only public research institution in New Orleans. And we're actually right on uh, the side of Lake Pontchartrain. And so our campus, um, again, is right on the, the, the lake, which is beautiful, except for when it floods a little bit. And um, this is the science building here, where actually they filmed Green Lantern in 2011. And then this is the chemistry building where my labs are um, right here. And so we have about 8,500 students right now. Um, Post-Katrina, we, we had a, a lot of students leave, and so we're now um, starting to gain back those students. And we have a faculty of about six in our department. So the outline of my talk today, I'll go into a little bit of background on what I do and why I do it. Um, and then I'm going to basically tell you a story about oxygenation. So how does petroleum go from nonpolar to polar? What's, what is responsible for the oxygenation of petroleum? And then once it gets into the water and becomes um, water soluble, what's that composition? What's its toxicity? And then what happens to it um, once it's in water? What's its fate and persistence? What is its re refractivity, um, its photolability? So before I begin, I just want to um, go over the many different sources of carbon that are in the environment right now. So you have permafrost, which is a large carbon reservoir. So when it thaws, it introduces carbon into the environment. You have algae blooms that can release um, dissolved organic carbon into the environment, microbial interactions. Um, you can have carbon leach from soil get into the environment, and then burn residues can also leach carbon into the environment. And so all of these are sources of dissolved organic carbon. The definition of dissolved organic carbon is anything that can pass through a 0.7 micron or less filter. And so um, another source of dissolved organic carbon is from petroleum. And so this is a picture of tar balls that were collected in Alabama, Mobile, Alabama, on the beach. And um, we found that they can also leach carbon once they're disturbed and in contact with water into the environment. And then we also have tar balls that can be washed up on shore from um, natural seepage. And so these are a source of carbon. And then, of course, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which occurred in our backyard, um, is a large source of carbon. And so rather than thinking of petroleum as um, gasoline that you put in your car, um, for this talk today, I just want you to think of it as a carbon source. And so um, there are many different sources of petrogenic carbon. So natural oil seeps, we have about 43% um, of carbon comes from natural oil seeps or petroleum introducing into the aquatic systems. And two of the largest natural seeps in the U.S. are in Santa Barbara, California. And that um, is a seeps a heavy oil, a viscous heavy oil. And then the Gulf of Mexico um, seeps a light, sweet crude oil. And then the other percent um, is anthropogenic uh, sources of carbon, which can come from oil spills. And so you have um, decades of oil spills that have occurred. 
And then you can also have industrial runoff as another source of um, petroleum-derived carbon entering into the uh, aquatic systems. And so why is this important? So oil spill, as we know, are a large contributor of petroleum into the ocean. This creates long-term effects on the surrounding ecosystems. And then petroleum can undergo many chemical and physical changes due to weathering. And we know um, now that photochemistry plays a major role in the fate of oil and spilled um, sunlit areas. So when oil is spilled, it reaches the surface of the water, and then it gets um, photooxidized by the sun. And that's the majority of where my work is going to start. And so before I um, continue on, I just want to explain what photochemistry is. Um, basically, it's the study of physical and chemical reactions that occur in the presence of light. So in order for a compound to um, absorb light, it must be a chromophore. And there are uh, only one molecule can absorb one photon of light. And then once a compound absorbs light, it can go through many different um, processes and conversions and transformations. And so not all chromophores that absorb light fluoresce. And so you have um, different types of energy release from that. So when I use the term photoreactivity, what does that mean? So when something is highly photoreactive, it's because it has a reaction that can occur when organic matter absorbs light. And this is responsible for different processes. And so organic matter is a known source of photochemically generated oxidants. And so how the organic matter reacts can give information about its origin. And so different reactive oxygen species exist that can be responsible for these reactions. So you can have hyd uh, hydroxyl radical, singlet oxygen, superoxide, and you can have um, triplet and singlet states. And so what are these reactive oxygen species? They're transient, short-lived reactive chemical radicals. And they're implicated in the mechanisms of organic matter transformations and biological processes. So in the um, DOM community, they're really um, well studied. And then what um, I was interested in for my work was that they're implicated in the photodegradation of organic pollutants. And so you, again, you have your single um, oxygen, hydroxyl radical, and other uh, photo uh, reaction oxygen species that are responsible for oxygenating these pollutants and then um, getting them to be oxygenated and integrated. And so studying their impacts on the oil system will help determine these important pathways and mechanisms um, when we think about uh, photodegradation and how the petroleum can become oxidized and become water soluble. And then um, we can use this data for oil spill algorithms. So that currently there's no oil spill algorithm that accounts for photochemistry. And so um, there's a need for quantitative data to um, you know, to include in these algorithms. So when an oil spill occurs, they can take into account what's being photodegraded. And so this is the basic setup for um, what I'm going to show you today. So I simulate many oil spills. And so this is my radiation procedure and setup. And so I'll show you this throughout the um, course of my talk. So I have a simulated sunlight source on the top. And then this is a quartz lid that prevents evaporation but allows all light to come in. The petroleum films are made on top of seawater, and the um, petroleum films are 120 microns thick. Then I have a thermostatically controlled beaker at 27 degrees Celsius, which was the temperature of the um, water during the BP oil spill. And the petroleum that I'm using today is from the BP oil spill. And then um, four hours in the solar simulator is equivalent to about one day of noon sunlight. And so this is really great that we can do accelerated photooxidation experiments and um, we're able to get uh, good data pretty fast. And this is an example of um, one of the smaller solar simulators. And then this is an example of the oil film over water. And so one of the questions, um, one of the research questions I had um, is, you know, we have this organic matter that's naturally found in the environment. And it can be terrestrial or microbial based. And this is um, the representative structure for fulvic and humic acid. And um, research done in the early 90s um, basically said or showed that when these compounds absorb light, they produce these reactive oxygen species. And so you have hydroxyl radicals, singlet oxygen, and triplet state uh, energy states. And so the research question was, well, when the oil spilled on the surface of the seawater, we know that there are chromophores in this oil because of its dark color. We know that they absorb all ranges of light. 
And so do the compounds in oil, which are polyaromatic hydrocarbons, we know that these are um, able to absorb light and they're very well studied, but collectively can these, um, when they when they absorb light, can they produce these photooxidants, these reactive oxygen species? And if they can, what are these degradation rates? What are these rates of oxygen in formation? In order to do this, um, so there's uh, different methods for detecting and quantitating reactive transient species, and so you have to use what's called a scavenger study. Because they're difficult to monitor, um, so for example, they're really, really short-lived, they're unstable, so hydroxyl radical, its lifetime is one picosecond. So you can't just go and measure it um, you know, in, the, in the water. And so you have to use what's called, what's, uh, you have to employ the use of a chemical probe. And chemical probes are very well studied, so we know, that we know the rate constant, so they react with the known rate constant. And then you look for either loss of your chemical probe or the formation of a product, and I'll go into this in a minute. And this is uh, widely used and characterized in the DOM community. And so the first uh, reactive oxygen species I looked at was singlet oxygen, and so I wanted to look at the solar production of singlet oxygen from crude oil films over water. And so the research plan and research question was, well, do our petroleum films produce singlet oxygen? We know that DOM, um, because it has similar structures and similar, similar functionalities, we know that they produce these reactive oxygen species. So we wanted to see if these petroleum films produce these reactive oxygen species, and if so, how much? And so we also know that singlet oxygen only selectively reacts with double bonds. And so we wanted to measure the single oxygen formation that was photo produced from petroleum films using these scavenger studies. And then um, I employed the use of furfural alcohol as a chemical probe, and then um, calculated steady state concentration, and then quantitated the total amount of moles that were produced in the system. And this allows us to get uh, reaction rate, formation rates, and uh, steady state concentrations. And then I also wanted to look at different sources of oil. So does composition, the starting composition matter when you have the production of the, the single oxygen? And so how do we quantitatively measure these reactive oxygen species? So you do steady state determination, which is a competition kinetics experiment. And so you change the um, concentration of your chemical probe, but you keep the light constant. Then you can indirectly determine the reactive oxygen species through the production or loss of a probe. And then you also have what's called the total trapping method. And this one, you keep the um, concentration constant where you know all the reactive oxygen species are effectively trapped, and then you vary the irradiation time. And so the mechanism for the product formation for singlet oxygen is shown here. And I always relate it to fishing because in Louisiana, we're big fishers and we like redfish. And so to catch redfish, you need a specific bait. So in this case, your bait would be your chemical probe. So for, for alcohol, in the case of single oxygen, is our bait. And the single oxygen is our redfish. And so if we want to catch redfish, we use that specific bait. And then your product is dinner. And so um, our product in this case is 6-hydroxy, 2-H pyran, 3-6-H-own, or what I like to call 6-H-P-own for short. And so this forms um, an 85%. And so you're able to take that formation of that product, make sure you account for the um, loss of 15%, and then you can calculate your formation rates. And so this is the experimental procedure. And instead of um, just seawater, the furfur alcohol is now in the water. And then for the, um, for the steady state concentration, I kept the exposure time constant, but I varied the benzoic acid concentration. And then I um, collected the water, filtered it, and then analyzed it using high-performance liquid chromatography. And so the hypothesis was, well, we should see a linear uh, product photo, for, we should see a linear photo production of our product over time. Um, and then once that precursor runs out, we should see a plateau. So once we effectively um, trap all of our single oxygen, we should start seeing a plateau. And then we're able to calculate the molar fraction of the moles of product produced to moles of product loss. And then it, here's a graphical representation of what the steady state concentration looks like. And again, this plateau means that we're effectively trapping all the single oxygen that's being produced in this system at these concentrations. And so this is a, um, a table of all the uh, data from this study. And so I looked at many different um, P 
pHs and then I looked at two different matrices. So I looked at pure water and then golf water um, to try and get some environmental relevance. And you can see that they're both pretty much the same. So we know we're producing single oxygen from petroleum because the pure water that doesn't have any um, native DOM is still producing these concentrations. Um, and then when you calculate, when you compared it to the studies just using DOM, we got similar values for studies that had high um, turbidity and uh, high uh, colored dissolved organic matter. And then the total trapping results um, are shown here. And this is the average number of moles of single oxygen per trapped. And then this is the radiation time. And then you can see that over time, we're producing um, a lot more moles um, of single oxygen uh, in the nano pure water and in the Gulf water over time. And so again, we know that we're producing, that single oxygen is uh, responsible and is a, a pathway for oxygenation of petroleum in these systems. It was not as um, large as we expected. It's actually similar to, like I said, the colored dissolved organic matter from like rivers and lakes, um, but it is a, a pathway to consider when thinking about these um, reaction mechanisms of uh, petroleum and when it's in contact with water and sunlight. And this is a graphical representation, so I did everything in triplicate over time. So for this um, reactive oxygen species, we know that petroleum films produced single oxygen. We had similar results when we compared it to um, using dissolved organic matter as source. And then we did know that this wasn't um, just because there was native DOM in the seawater that we used because we did it on nanopure water as well and got the same result. Um, so future studies, we wanted to look at the effect of dispersant and see if that um, contributes to the uh, to dispersing the oil and then producing more single oxygen over time. And that would tell us a lot about the degradation rates and if dispersant actually is a good viable solution for oil spill remediation. And then the next reactive transient I looked at was benzoic acid, um, or using benzoic acid to react with hydroxyl radical. And so this is again the same um, uh, relationship. So you have your chemical probe reacts with hydroxyl radical and forms a product, parahydroxybenzoic acid. And so the experimental, again, is the same, but instead of for, for alcohol, for single oxygen, I use benzoic acid. Now, the thing with hydroxyl radical is that it will react with anything. Single oxygen only reacts with double bonds, but hydroxyl radical, it doesn't care. It reacts with everything it comes in contact with. And again, that water was taken and then filtered and then run on high-performance liquid chromatography. And so these are the results from the steady state concentration and so this is the oil system at pH 8 because that's the pH of the, um, of the Gulf. And then this was the, um, the data from the paper that I got the method from. And so you can see the formation rate for the hydroxyl radical with our oil systems was much more than the, just the dissolved organic matter alone. The scavenging rate was higher and then the steady state concentration was higher. And so again, this um, proves that our oil systems, hydroxyl radical is a main pathway to consider when petroleum comes in contact with light and becomes oxygenated. So now we know we have two pathways that are responsible for how petroleum becomes water soluble. And this is a graphical representation. And so this is the, um, these are the different concentrations at a single time period of benzoic acid. This is the rate of benzoic acid formation. And you'll notice that as it comes up here, and we have this plateau. And this plateau means that we're effectively trapping all the hydroxyl radicals in our systems. And so at 10 millimolar, we can say that we're effectively trapping all the hydroxyl radical that are being produced um, at, the, at that concentration. And so now we did the total trapping experiment where we kept that benzoic acid concentration constant at 10 millimolar and then varied the exposure time so that we can look at um, how many moles of hydroxyl radicals were trapped over time. And again, um, we use high-performance liquid chromatography. And so these are the data for, I did a bunch of different um, pHs, and then I did um, a different water matrices. But the environmentally relevant system, of course, is the one we're interested in. So the pure water had higher amounts of moles trapped than the seawater, and we think it's because the seawater contains other, um, other compounds that's going to be competing for hydroxyl radical. And so it was a little bit lower. Uh, but you can see over time that we're producing um, a lot of hydroxyl radical. 
And this is a graphical representation of the triplicate um, done for the total trapping. And again, you start to see this plateau at the end. And we think that this plateau is being formed because, again, we're, um, the, we're all of our hydroxyl radicals reacting with our chemical probes. So there's no more left to, to um, react with. And so this is uh, really important because now we have this proposed mechanism and pathway of how these compounds are becoming oxygenated and what rate they're becoming oxygenated. And um, so the two that are most plausible, so this one um, is when your pH, so the pHs are what we think are the main um, chromophores in oil. And so the P just stands for pH because oil is a complex mixture, so you can't really say for sure what exactly um, each compound is. And so the pH will can either it can take an, a photon here, and then that can form your uh, triplet or your uh, singlet state, which then reacts with ground state oxygen, or your pH can um, react with ground state oxygen and then produce this intermediate. And so singlet oxygen is formed in this area, and then hydroxyl radical is formed over here. So we know that hydroxyl radicals were photochemically produced from these oil systems. Now we have a proposed pathway and mechanism of how these um, petroleum compounds are becoming oxygenated. And so we were able to determine rates, and we um, knew for sure that in this system that all the hydroxyl radicals were effectively trapped. So now I just um, showed you that you know, these reactive oxygen species are responsible for oxygenation of petroleum. I also did organic triplets, which I wasn't going to show you today, but it has the same pathway as single oxygen. Um, so now that we understand how the oxygen is, um, is being um, reacted to the petroleum, I want to go into what um, is being produced in the water. What's the composition of that now petroleum-derived dissolved organic matter? Um, what is it? What's its toxicity? So I'm going to change gears and go into a little bit of the analytical instrumentation. So in order to study a complex mixture, you need a suite of advanced analytical instrumentation um, because you can, you're dealing with you know, you know, 14,000 to 20,000 different compounds in your sample. And so um, you have to use a wide variety of advanced analytical uh, instrumentation. The first one's not so advanced. It's a total organic carbon analyzer. And this just tells us the amount of dissolved organic carbon uh, concentrations in our samples. This is the only quantitative measurement we can make in a complex mixture, is um, to just look at how much carbon. And since petroleum is made up of hydrocarbons, it's the best um, measurement we have for looking at concentration. The second is excitation emission matrix spectroscopy, and this is a three-dimensional technique used to measure optical characteristics from chromophores in complex mixtures. And then the last one is Fourier Transform Ion Cyclotron Resonance Mass Spectrometry, or FTICRMS. And this is an ultra-high resolution mass spectrometry technique. Um, and this gives you molecular level characterization for complex mixtures. And so you're able to obtain elemental formulas down to the billionth place. And so you can um, start to really understand the um, composition of your, of your samples. And so I'm not going to go into the total organic carbon analyzer. I'm just going to... Um, Fast forward to excitation matrix spectroscopy and what it is. We call it EAMS for short. And it's a fluorescence contouring technique, and it's really good for complex mixtures because it helps identify different fluorescent compounds. So to give you an example, if you excite at 350 nanometers, then you collect an emission at 300 to 800 nanometers. You can get a peak that looks like this. If you uh, move over 50 nanometers, and again, excite at 300 nanometers, and then you collect uh, emission spectrum from 300 to 800, you get a different peak. And then if you move 50 again, you get a different peak. So it really starts to tease out these different um, fluorophores in your, in your complex mixture. And so, yes, yeah, so this is, it looks pretty. It's really colorful. But looking at this, I can't really get any information from it. I can get inferences, like if I see this shift up or shift down, but I really don't know uh, what else is going on. And sometimes I have 100 samples. And so to look through 100 different EAMs, it's really complicated. So you have to employ the use of uh, statistical analysis called parallel factor analysis, or parafac. Para and what it is, it decomposes your EAMs and their underlying chemical components. And so it represents um, fluorophores to each component. So if you have 100 samples, you can basically um, reduce the data down to you know, five or six 
different components that show you the different um, areas of where your fluorescence is the strongest. And so a lot of people call this mathematical chromatography because it's based on a lot of algorithms. And so you basically have to um, go and do the statistical analyses, validate these, these models, um, and so they have to go through a lot of checks and balances for this to um, for this to be good for your samples. And this is really good for environmental samples because we don't know the concentration of what we're measuring. We don't know the identity of our fluorophores. And so um, it really helps uh, tease out those differences and, and you can really start understanding um, your, your sample. So for me, I have light versus dark and so it's really great to see you know, what's, what's in my sample after I um, subject it to sunlight. And then lastly, I wanted to just go over the um, last advanced analytical technique that I use. So I did a postdoc at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory for two years, and so this was the instrument that I used. Um, it's a 21 Tesla FTICR, and it's the one of two in the world. And um, what it does is it, you can take your complex mixture, so this is an example of what the spectrum looks like, and then if you zone in, you can zone into a 0.3 Dalton window. You can resolve up to 10 peaks in that 0.3 Dalton window. So for this one sample, I was able to resolve 14,000 peaks in one sample. And so right now, um, there are still people uh, analyzing petroleum, and I think they've identified up to like 150,000 peaks is what they're up to now. So that's a little too much for me. I just want to know uh, what's in my samples at this level. And so again, this is the same thing with the Eames. You can't just look at this spectrum and say, oh, you know, I can see Eureka, I can see what's going on. You have to um, go through data reduction again. And so basically from this point, you calibrate it and then you go um, and assign your molecular formulas. And once you assign your molecular formulas, then you can start making bar charts. And so this is your percent relative abundance. And then these are your header atom content that you derive from your different formulas. And now you can start looking at um, different um, relative abundances of your different header atoms. And so for me, because I'm adding oxygen, I'm really interested in you know, things that, um, that increase in oxygen over time. And you can also represent the data using a Van Crevelin diagram. And this is based on aromaticity ratio from your hydrogen to carbon and then your oxygen to carbon. And so where it lands in the Van Crevelin space gives you a lot of information about the composition. So for instance, if you have um, more aliphatic-like compounds, they're going to have a high H to C and they're going to have a low O to C. You can have unsaturated low, which will fall into this category. The blue is your unsaturated high oxygen. You have aromatic and then condensed aromatic. And again, this is all based on the aromaticity of your compounds. And so um, looking at like the differences in where these peaks move can give you a lot of information about the composition. So in my case, I know that I'm producing a lot of oxygen, so I would expect to see a lot of oxygen compounds here. And in my dark, I wouldn't expect to see a lot of oxygen in there. And so now I've showed you the instruments that I use to characterize that now um, dissolved petroleum, there's now dissolved oxygenated petroleum compounds. So now I want to go into um, the question of, well, how much petroleum is photodissolved after an oil spill? And so this is the setup. So I did two different oils because I wanted to know, does the, comp does the source composition matter? And do I have different products in the water um, if I irradiate a heavy oil versus a light oil? And then the heavy oil was, um, it was uh, from NIST, and then the light oil was the Makanda crude from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And again, it's the same setup. And just to give you perspective, this is the water that I collected after 120 hours of solar simulation. So the heavy oil, the water was very, very yellow. This is after filtering. And the light oil, it was a tinge of, of yellow, but you can't really tell because this just um, takes all the credit. It's just bright, bright yellow. And then I did the suite of analytical techniques that I explained to you earlier to try and understand what compounds are in here. So this is an example of the dissolved organic carbon analysis. So the dissolved organic carbon concentrations are here. The exposure period is here. So I did um, from 0 to 24 hours in 24-hour increments all the way to 240 hours, which is equivalent to about 60 days of noon sunlight. And then the heavy is in black. And so the light 
can see it starts to plateau here, so it stops producing carbon over time. And if you looked at the actual oil film, it was um, turning white in some places, so we believe that the chromophores that are in there are becoming more photobleached, so they're not producing as much carbon. The heavy oil was very messy. It became actually very, very brittle, and so it started to just break apart. Um, and one thing about doing this is you want to make sure that you're covering, you know, what you're producing because what you're producing is also photolabile, so it's photoreactive as well. And I think that's what was happening here is that, you know, those films were breaking and then it was um, the, the DOM that I was producing was also photobleaching. So it's a little bit tricky with the heavy oil. This is an example of the Parafac analysis that I did on 120 samples for this project. I was able to validate a six component model and looking at the literature I was able to um, go in and identify um, what these types of uh, components were and so three um, were sort of your natural DOM fluorescence like signatures. So a lot of the DOM literature they want to um, bend them like into like, so they call them fulvic-like, humic-like, protein-like. However, because we know that we're deriving from hydrocarbons, we want to get away from that and start looking at like, you know, bending them into their compositional classes, like this is aromatic-like, this is aliphatic-like, et cetera. And so that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, and then now you can look at over time, if you go, like say you start here for your petroleum, and then after 240 hours you end up here, um, so then you can say that you have highly oxygenated um, aromatic systems in your, in your samples. And that's just an example of how you can interpret parafactor analysis, and that's about all I'm going to go into for this talk. And so um, you can also look at if you see a blue shift over time to shorter wavelengths, which would mean photobleaching, or an increase in um, wavelength, which is called a red shift. So then this is usually associated with higher oxygen content in your samples and aromatic structures. So I also did toxicity. So I ran a microtox assay. It's a, it's a chemibiolumin, it's a bioluminescent um, probe, and then you look at the uh, inhibition of that bioluminescence over time. I'm not a toxicologist, I'm a chemist, um, but that's like a, a quick and easy assay that you can do to kind of screen for toxicity, but it by no means is, is um, it's just a screening tool. So what we uh, saw for this, so we took the water, put it into the mycotox. We had the same uh, concentration of DOM so that we could look at toxicity as a function of composition and not a function of concentration. And so if you have um, data that uh, doesn't correlate very strongly, you can do what's called a Spearman's correlation. And so this is taking the mass spec data and it's comparing um, different losses or changes over time. And so the blue means that it was um, not uh, correlated and the red means that it's highly correlated. So over time, we saw a high, higher correlation with unsaturated high oxygen and aromatics with the heavy. And then we saw with the light DOM we had over time more aliphatic, highly oxygenated compounds. So again, this tells us that the starting composition of the petroleum does matter when we're looking at um, uh, what's being formed and characterizing that uh, petroleum dissolved organic matter. Down here is the, the results from the acute toxicity. And so this tells us that initially, so you have um, highly correlated, Initially, that toxicity was high, but over time, um, it actually was not was less toxic. And then again, for the um, light oil, initially it was toxic, and then over time it became non-toxic. And so we saw that as the character, as, as the composition of the dissolved organic matter um, became more fluorescent at longer wavelengths, and it looked more like your DOM-like uh, material, that it was actually less toxic. And so this just gives us um, kind of a, a head start into what direction we need to go and what, um, what time points we need to look into if we're going to try and look into toxicity more. Um, so we'd obviously send these off to a toxicologist. So conclusions and considerations. Um, I showed you that increasing photoprocessing changes the optical properties of our petrodom um, and they become more similar to um, dissolved organic matter from terrestrial microbial, microbial sources and not petroleum. Um, we saw a decrease in toxicity over time, 
And then um, we showed that fluorescence can be used as a tool for toxicity monitoring. So you can't take um, FTICR MS out to the field and run samples and understand composition. So the idea is to try and find um, a link between the fluorescence and the high resolution so that when you're going to um, these sites that are contaminated with oil, you can do a quick screen and say, hey, this might be toxic, let's do some further testing. Because toxicity tests are extremely expensive, especially when you're doing gene expression. And so you want to make sure that you, you, know, you test the right uh, compounds and um, you don't waste time and money. Um, the DOC data we can use for uh, photochemical model modeling algorithms. And then um, we know that the heavy and light uh, composition of that petroleum produced different um, petrodom. Uh, petro and um, because the first 24 hours we saw that toxicity correlation, uh, we can infer that the first six days of the oil spill may be the most toxic, and those are the times that we need to really um, understand and, and do some more testing. So the last part I'm going to go over for this talk is now I've showed you um, that we are producing this material that may be toxic in the first 24 hours, um, and there's a lot of it, right? There's a lot of DOC in that, uh, in that sample. And so now we want to know what happens to it um, when it's by itself without oil and it's just floating around. And so this next study looks at the photolability and fate of that petroleum-derived dissolved organic matter. And so, um, and so we also wanted to look at the difference between the heavy and light and see if there's a difference in the composition of how it degrades. And so the question was, what's the fate of this um, petroleum-derived carbon once it's produced in aqueous systems? And so what we did was we took the DOC um, from the last study, and we wanted to know at what point was it um, the same, at what time point was it the same, because what we're going to do is take this time point and generate the petrodom, and then take that, remove it from the oil, and then um, expose that to different uh, irradiation times to look at the photorefractory and photolability of that material. And so, um, as I showed you before, it was light colored in yellow. And so that's the uh, petroleum drive DOM here. And then the setup is the same. And then we ran the same suite of techniques um, for this study. And this is what it looked like. So you have your heavy oil. Um, petroleum-derived DOM, and then you have your light oil here. And so what we found was that it was extremely photolabile in the beginning, but after 96 hours, we didn't see much change. And so this is the uh, light DOM here and the heavy here. And we could also infer from the change in the slope that the heavy DOM had a faster rate of degradation than the light DOM. And that made sense, because if you think about the heavy oil, um, it has more aromatic, it's darker. Um, so we would expect that that had more um, aromatic character and that that would photodegrade faster. And so um, to understand what's left, we wanted to do a spearman correlation to look at the changes in these um, and the compositional classes derived from the FTICRMS data. And so we noticed the blue is the non-correlated um, versus time, and then the, the red is correlated with time. And so the blue, initially, we have aliphatic, unsaturated, low oxygen. And then over time, we had more highly unsatur un unsaturated, uh, oxygenated species. And this is for the um, light oil. And so the light oil, we know, has a lot of aliphatic um, type compounds in it, which are not chromophores. The heavy oil, however, we did see um, a lot of change. We saw loss and condensed aromatics and aromatics over time. Um, and then we saw this shift from low oxygen to high oxygen. And so this is what's left. This is the photorefractory um, component of, this, of what's in this water. And so the next question is, well, we know it's no longer um, photolabile, but is it biolabile? Like if we fed this to microbes, would the microbes now want to, um, to degrade it? So that's the next focus of this, of this work. And so in summary, we saw a significant fraction of this petrogenic carbon OS photorefractory. We calculated about 50% for the heavy and then 70% for the light. Um, and then we saw a removal of the petroleum optical signatures after 96 hours of irradiation. Um, we did see a loss in aromatic compounds, which would again um, correlate with the fluorescence in that we saw uh, this removal of those optical signatures. 
And then again, this is dependent on the initial composition of an oil source. So if you have an oil spill um, in California where it's like this heavy viscous oil versus the oil spill that occurred with the lighter oil, you're going to have different um, outcomes of what's being produced in the water. And so all of this ties back to trying to understand um, carbon photochemistry. So a lot of my work done at the Mag Lab, um, well, when I was a grad student, I did mostly um, interlaboratory work. I didn't leave the lab. And when I started doing my postdoc, I got into more of like field work um, type studies and started uh, going out and doing um, this suite of techniques using uh, looking at groundwater uh, plumes and where oil spills were um, just sitting in aquifers and anoxic conditions. And so now I wanted to um, take what I learned in the lab and try to apply it to what we're learning in the field. And so if you think about you have all of these anthropogenic sources, you have runoffs, you have your um, rivers and lakes, and you know that um, oil, when it's spilled, you have your DOM that's produced, and it can go through this photolysis and have these radicals, has refractory photoproducts, and then possibly your biologically available photoproducts. And all this is contributing into the carbon cycle. And so then you also have your natural seeps. So the natural seeps, the oil is buoyant, so it's going to come up to the surface and again have these same type of um, processes and reactions occurring. And so um, what I hope to convince you today is that um, oils, oil is a contributor of carbon into this uh, global carbon um, cycle, and it does have effects on the surrounding ecosystems when there is an oil spill occurring. And so I will take questions if you guys have any, and that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Did you test under different temperature conditions? Uh, for example, I'm thinking, you know, if this were Arctic Ocean mm -hmm. at 33 degrees Fahrenheit or something like, well, maybe a little bit less than that, maybe 28 or 29, and versus the Gulf of Mexico at whatever it might be. Yeah, so that's on our radar for sure. Um, I'm actually here. Um, oh, okay. Um, the the question was, would temperature have an effect on these uh, photochemical processes? So if an oil spill happened in the Arctic versus the Gulf, would I expect different results? Is that correct? Um, so yeah, so I'm here actually doing a collaboration with Pat Tomko over in chemistry. And uh, he does a lot of the cold water oil spill research. And so we're here to collaborate and try to learn more about that. Um, because this was specifically from the BP oil spill, we wanted to do conditions that were strictly, you know, what it was during the BP oil spill. Um, but if I had to guess, I would guess that the, the processes would be a lot, a lot slower in colder environments. And you, you answered my second question, sort of, but I, you know, I was just going to ask, what's your connection with UAA or, you know, why are you here? And I was wondering if you're... Yeah, um, <laughs> I was volunteered to give to give the talk in engineering, um, so yeah, so that's why I'm here. But I'm working with Pat Tomko, and we actually went, um, we took a beaver to um, Eleanor Island to dig up lingering oil, and we found a lot there. Did you say where? Eleanor? Eleanor, yep. And so we dug Eleanor. up, yeah, so we went and dug up oil, and it was mostly um, in the sediment, and then we had a bunch of sheens um, on the top. but. From Valley's yep. Mm -hmm. So we collected a bunch of that oil, and we're going to look at um, what's what's remaining in it. Is it photolay bile, um, that sort of thing? So, yeah. Yeah, I was surprised how much was there. So, yes, sir. Yes, uh, you said you uh, when the oil spill was was taking place, you there's, there's there was always quite a Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're going to push your reaction, why would you sink it into the water column and get it away from the sun? And you know, you you push it, try and turn it less toxic. So it would seem like as though some of the studies that are coming now back is that all you've done is delayed, and it's coming back up after, after with the dispersant. Time. They tended to roll into more of a tarball, roll into more of a, a mousse, mm -hmm. and then, you know, it, the sporadic hits on the beaches and, and those types of areas. So you've been out collecting 
some of those areas that were heavily hit with either age or, or weather doyle, how far down the spill did you go? Did you get to so a I like uh, Ch Chignik, or were you pretty much just going to come? So I wasn't involved in the tarball collection. I collaborated with uh, Oklahoma University, and they were out there, um, you know, three times a year collecting tarballs off the coast of Mobile, Alabama. And those are the tarballs that we used for our study. And we found that um, once the tarballs interacted with water, they leached, you know, compounds into the water, and then we hit those with light, and then took the, the water, filtered it, and then fed it to microbes and saw that there was um, microbial activity. So the petro uh, dissolved organic matter was actually biolabile. Um, so that was a study that I did that I, unfortunately I didn't get to go collect tarballs. Um, I still wasn't into field, the only time I did field, or well, the first time I did field research was in my postdoc, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, so they went all the way to the Mobile coast, but I know collaborators who go Pensacola and they dig up and they still see oil like down in the sand, kind of like Eleanor Island where you're digging and then it just, you know, appears in the layers of the sediment. So, yeah. Well, and then I do have a lot of, um, I have a paper coming out or that I'm going to submit, we'll see how it goes, uh, that I did dispersant work. And what I saw was that the oil itself actually um, was the most dramatic, so it photodegraded faster in the presence of dispersant than in the non-dispersant systems. And then the uh, carbon that was produced in the water, it was like twofold, the concentrations in the non-dispersed systems, um, but the composition was the same. So it's just producing more of the same stuff. So um, that was, those are the, the data that I have on dispersant. But are you saying that it delayed it or increased it? It increased the photodissolution. And whether or not that's toxic, that's another story. I didn't, I don't have toxicity data on that yet, but um, it's just going to be the letters paper probably. But it just shows that uh, dispersant actually enhanced the photodissolution of petroleum, and it degraded the, the um, petroleum films substantially. So using the techniques that I, that I used, that's what I saw. No, no, that's out of my area. That's out of my wheelhouse. Okay. Yeah. Biological. Yeah. No, I'm just a chemist. <laughs> I collaborate with biologists and toxicologists. Um, 